Yeah! That's damn gorgeous. <laughs> Harnessing the power of the sun is what the race for nuclear fusion is all about. It's a race to create limitless energy and brilliant minds the world over from USA to France, Japan, and dozens of other countries are attempting to achieve stable fusion. Honestly, we're looking for our tesseract. Sustained fusion would provide nearly unlimited power and lead to industrial innovation on levels that we've never seen before. I mean, imagine doping a country's water supply with just a little bit of Adderall. So much would get done. That's the effect that unlimited power would have on innovation. Being passionate about astronomy pretty much my entire life and having dabbled a bit with high voltages, I wanted to make my own star in a jar. Something to always bring me back to an innovative center. After several weeks of drilling, sanding, soldering, tweaking, and gluing, plus several setbacks, Come on! I finally see why these Farnsworth fusers are kind of a big deal. <laughs> Now, if you haven't seen the news lately, nuclear fusion is kind of back on the menu. From the joint European tourists recently doubling its own energy record, to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory improving their energy yield by 800%, to the Max Planck Institute fixing plasma instabilities, we're overcoming the wall of hurdles this power source throws at us. But it's amazing that we're trending towards sustained fusion at least, you know, basically controlling the power of a star. And after you've watched me try to build a star in a jar, I highly recommend you head on over to brilliant.org to learn how fusion takes place in our own sun. Let's take a look. Their astrophysics section is on point and involves physics basics, astronomical measuring techniques, star life cycle and nuclear fusion, as well as interstellar travel and exoplanets. The energy production in STARS course gets right to the point and covers why atomic nuclei sometimes need a bit of a push in order to fuse and how that spells power output. It's full of interactive animations and graphics, and it asks thought-provoking multiple-choice questions. If you get a question wrong, it breaks down the correct answer for you, so that you walk away learning a thing or two. Brilliant's honestly an incredible way to learn physics and science interactively, and topics range from mechanics and electronics to quantum objects, gravitational physics, and even advanced calculus. They legit have thousands of lessons with exclusive new content added monthly. Personally, I've been using it to kind of brush up on my understanding of fusion, and ultimately it's kind of helped with the science that you're about to see. You can get started for free by visiting brilliant.org slash plasma channel, or click on the link in the description down below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So, in the middle of the groovy 1960s, one of the inventors of digital television had a bright idea for producing sustained nuclear fusion. He called that idea the Farnsworth Fuser. Now, how fusion works in the first place is actually pretty remarkable and can be achieved in a couple of different ways. You can use intense lasers with a heated inertial confinement, such as LLNL setup, or a ring of plasma with magnetic confinement, as with IDRIS setup, but they both have the same goal, to fuse individual deuterium and tritium atoms into one larger mass of helium. And when they fuse, a small percentage of mass is actually lost in the process. It's like this disgusting tomatoes. So, where does it go? Well, it's converted into pure energy. You know, the whole E equals MC squared thing the dude with the pipe talked about. Now, there is another way to achieve fusion, and it's called inertial electrostatic confinement. This is our fuser. Whereas fusion normally requires immense pressure and pretty much the power of a sun, this method requires an extremely low vacuum and tens of thousands of juicy volts as the driving force. The latter of those two is definitely a bit more within my capabilities, so I got to work gathering supplies for a star in a jar. Now, I've never worked with vacuums before, so pretty much everything about this project was new to me. Let alone the fact that I was trying to build a nuclear fuser, right? Regardless, I did have a couple of characteristics I wanted this build to have. You see, this summer I spent some time in Egypt and I found an appreciation for the geometric shapes within the pyramids. So I wanted a triangle base and a circular reaction chamber. All seeing eye anybody? I also wanted a compact minimalistic design and for it to be plug and play with minimal setup. No loose wires. As I was about to begin the build process, I learned that one of my patrons had professional fusion experience and wanted to help. Meet Chris. 
He worked at Idaho Accelerator Center and the Stanford Linear Accelerator, so we sat down for a chat. So since you made one back you know, a few years ago, do you have any recommendations for uh, making a fuser that's going to be successful or isn't going to kill me? So successful and not killing you, I think kind of fall in two different categories here. Keeping kind of short distances between things with shutoff valves is actually really helpful. The biggest reason why you need that vacuum is because you need a free mean path for your ion will collide with enough energy to actually fuse. Um, sometimes you can flush your environment uh, with a inert gas or your hydrogen, for example. Things are, that are dangerous around the, the fusars are the vacuum. Um, you can implode things. And the, the other thing is, is, of course, the high voltage, which you're well aware of. <laughs> yeah. X-ray production is a thing here, especially since you're uh, freeing up these ions. And these ions are now having a chance to travel uh, the electrons are traveling. Um, neutrons are another one that that's dangerous. So especially since I'm going to be above 40 or 50 kilovolts in particular, uh, so higher risk. Okay. Above that 40 mark usually is dealing in the X-ray X-ray area. A good five six feet away is where I would stand. We talked a bit more about using vacuum grease, avoiding the use of silicone seals, and making sure my wire grid had parallel surfaces. I learned a lot from that conversation, and as you'll see coming up, it actually influenced my build. So that combined with the fact that I now had supplies in hand, <laughs> ooh, nuclear physics was imminent. Okay, putting it all together, the physical part of the build is complete. You can see I used Juicy Nuclear Green and it's pretty minimalistic in design. And once I add gaskets, this will be all set up for a vacuum. So on to the power source next. I plan to run my fuser at more than 50 kilovolts DC and to provide that kind of voltage, I'll need to use a voltage multiplier fed by an external high voltage source. That is what this space is for, so that I can build a voltage multiplier right into the base, making it more compact. So after a few hours of curing, <laughs> look at this sexy meatloaf. You gotta love what epoxy does. It, it protects high voltage components, but it also looks nice, right? And the multiplier fits perfectly in the base. After adding some connections, this little nuclear bundle of joy should be good to go. I hope. And here it is with all connections in place. Okay, the way I see it, there's three separate tests to run. First, does the multiplier produce high enough voltage? Second, can I pull a strong enough vacuum? And third, does it even light up in the first place like it's supposed to? So, onto the multiplier. My flyback supply provided eight kilovolts AC, which I just fed directly into the multiplier. Let's see what you got. You sound angry. Oh! <laughs> yeah, that'll do. The multiplier produces well over 40 kilovolts, which is a healthy start. So check that one and onto the vacuum. Busting out the pump, I connected the tubing on both ends and hoped for the best. Let's go, baby. Okay. Come on. Come on. Well, I only got down to about a half an inch or 500 microns of mercury, which is nowhere near the 30 to 50 I'm supposed to be at for this to work. And this pump is rated for 15 microns, so something's going on. I probably have a leak somewhere. Considering silicone really isn't the best seal for vacuums, that alone could be the problem. 
So I headed to my local mom and pop store to sort through different types of rubber and find myself some Vitron, which came highly recommended. Here's the old silicone that really didn't cut it. And here's the new Vitron seal or Vitron, have you pronounce it. You can see it's a lot stiffer. So hopefully that makes a difference. Oh, let this be the day. Okay, uh, that looks better so far. I'm gonna let that run for a minute and then check on it. Well, I tried everything. I even added some vacuum grease and I couldn't get it below about 400 microns. So I don't think the gaskets are the issue. They're actually pretty beefy. I'm wondering if the leak is coming from the threaded piping that goes into the chamber. So I did some research and I found there's actually a product you can buy right off the shelf that's used in industrial vacuum situations for exactly this problem. After a quick trip to yet another small mom and pop store, enter JB Weld. This is the quick solution I chose. Genius me chose the type that hardens in five minutes, so I had to work fast. I gave it six hours to cure, AKA I went to bed. It's the next morning, so the JB Weld should be completely dried. And if this doesn't solve the vacuum leaks, then that means I have a pump problem. Third time's the charm. I'm gonna let that run for a couple minutes, come back and check on it. You see this? That's what I'm looking for. The epoxy worked, thank God, because I tried a bunch of other solutions and nothing was working. But now the vacuum was strong enough, that meant only one thing. It meant busting out my x-ray and radiation detector because I was about to give this thing some power. Ah, uh, hello! <laughs> yes. I love how it's lighting up, but mm, it's still not working. It's supposed to glow a bright purple or a, or a bright white. It's not doing that, which tells me that the pressure still isn't low enough. And I've checked, I don't have any leaks in the whole system, that's for sure, which tells me that my pump is not cut out for the job. So I called in the Calvary, all 38 pounds of it, bought a new pump. It's massive compared to the pump I had been using, <sighs> man and uh, also massively expensive. So Patreons, thank you for supporting my work. This is your money at work. This pump was complete overkill, but it was my Hail Mary and it came with a touch screen and it was Bluetooth enabled. So that's actually pretty sick. Damn. That's damn gorgeous. Considering that was pretty epic and it was just using atmospheric air, I wanted to spice things up a bit by injecting a little bit of helium. Let's go for helium. Oh, that's more, that's way more diffuse. Dude, that's so much brighter. That's so much brighter. Through all my tests, I found zero radiation, but that's all gonna change in the next video when I inject deuterium and tritium, so consider subscribing. I did film this video in two different locations while moving to a different city, so that kind of added some complexities to the build, but oh well, right? Oh, and merch. Uh, the shirts that I've been wearing are available online. I'll leave a link down below, and I have a bunch of new designs coming down the pipeline. A huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, to Chris for his help, and to all of my Patreons who patiently support my work. Let me know your honest thoughts down below, and you, stay classy.